recently, China has said that the U.S. as Milius destroyer um, has made um, illegal transit in the Spratleys as well as the Paracels. Is that true? Is it illegal? No, not to anybody who, who isn't a state lawyer in Beijing. So the transit uh, two days ago was past Mischief Reef, which is uh, one of the features in the Spratleys. It is underwater in its natural state. It's one of these islands that China artificially created after 2013. And the 2016 Arbitral Award specifically says that Mischief Reef does not exist. It is not an island. It is a piece of the seabed and it belongs in the Philippines. So what the USS Milius did was it went within 12 miles, which would be the territorial sea if there was one, and then it conducted normal operations to prove that there is no territorial sea, that China's claim is illegal. The operation two weeks ago in the Paracels challenged a different Chinese claim. China has what it calls straight baselines around the Paracels. Uh, it's basically taken uh, tens of thousands of square miles of what should be international waters and claim that they're, inter that they're internal waters of China in gross violation of international law. So it's not illegal to, to sail through uh, what we class as territorial waters. Is that correct? Correct. But that's not what happened in either of these cases. Now, in, under international law, if you have territorial waters, uh, international law guarantees all vessels the right of what's called innocent passage. You can go from point A to point B. In, 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 in territorial waters. Um, and that is what the U.S. does around some of the islands that China claims that the U.S. recognizes as islands. In this case, that's not what happened. Mischief Reef is not an island. It does not have territorial waters. And in the case of the Paracels, the U.S. did not challenge territorial waters. The U.S. challenged these gross straight baselines that China has declared around the whole archipelago. Um, which nobody else in the world recognizes. So it seems that the South China Sea is another point of conflict between China uh, and the US. Um, you know, is there, do you see any resolution to this? The South China Sea disputes cannot be resolved. Um, the positions of the claimants are mutually exclusive. They can be managed. They were managed for many decades. What has changed is that over the last 10 years, Xi Jinping has elevated this issue within the domestic political context in China. It's become kind of uncompromisable under his leadership. It's, it's hard to see how the tensions can be dialed back and managed as long as Beijing maintains this uncompromising position. The U.S.'s position is that China's claims are legal. That is also the position of almost everybody else in the world. The real um, problem here is between China and the other claimants. And the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, they are the ones who are on the end of China's coercion. The code of conduct, which you know, has been kicking around, I understand, for about 20 years. Um, do you see this as being an answer at all? Um, unfortunately, no. I mean, so the code of conduct has been in the ether. It's been negotiated for more than 25 years now. The Philippines actually wrote the first draft of the Code of Conduct at the behest of the rest of ASEAN, the Association of South Asian Nations, in 1998. China, uh, at that time, refused to compromise on any of the fundamental issues that would be necessary. It won't agree on what the geographic scope of the disputes is. It won't agree to make it legally binding. Those same issues are at stake today. So the reason the code of conduct failed 20 years ago has not changed. And Beijing has shown no willingness to meet Vietnam or the Philippines or Indonesia halfway. Um, how has China sought to frame um, the U.S. in the South China Sea? So China's position, particularly the last 10 years, has um, focused on this narrative of containment that everything that's happening in the South China Sea is caused by a U.S. containment strategy backed up by Japan. The problem with that is that it only resonates with certain foreign partners. It does not actually resonate in the region, because if you're in the Philippines, your problem is not that the U.S. is telling you to stamp to China. The problem is that China's stealing your, stealing your fish, stealing your oil and gas. The same is true in Vietnam or Malaysia or the Philippines or, or Indonesia or Japan or India. Um, China's refusal to recognize its own role 
in these tensions and its refusal to acknowledge that any of its neighbors have their own decision making power is a big part of the problem here right it it refuses to acknowledge that this isn't a us plot um, and if we look on the other side if we want to talk about framing then uh, the us as well as its friends and allies will you know talk about a rules based order um, and that obviously china is is breaking that backed up by the international tribunal. Uh, you know, we use the term rules-based order a lot. Um, and China likes to complain about parts of the rules-based order. And China has reason to complain about some parts of the rules-based order. It wasn't there when some of these rules were written. It mm -hmm. was there when Uncle's was written. China, in fact, had a privileged seat at the table. China wrote these rules. It had as much hand in it as the U.S. or the Philippines or anybody else. The rules have not changed. China has. China liked these rules until the 1990s. And now a more powerful China has decided that the rules no longer apply. And so say if um, in, in a scenario where, I mean, Beijing is building up um, uh, the militarizing the islands, and as you even said, you know, Mr. Chief, finally creating an island that wasn't even there before. Um, in a scenario where China does own the South China Sea, what happens? Well, one, the U.S.-Philippine alliance probably dies um, because if the Philippines looks around one day and says, you know, we, we've, we're your oldest ally in the region. Um, we provided basing for decades. We continue to provide support and you couldn't even help us defend our legal rights. It really undermines the whole regime underpinned by the U.N. Convention on the Wall of the Sea because this could not be simpler. The U.N. Convention on the Wall of the Sea says every country on Earth, big or small, gets 200 miles of water. And China says, no, I get 1,000. You can't have a rules-based system in which China gets to say, no, I get five times as much as everybody else on Earth because I want it. And how about in terms of international trade um, and also owning all of those rich resources? The resources are a bit of a red herring. If you took every drop of oil known to exist in the South China Sea and you dropped it in China tomorrow, it accounts for about two years of daily oil consumption. The natural gas can really only be piped to the nearest coastline. So Philippine gas only helps the Philippines. Vietnamese gas only helps Vietnam. So it's not about oil and gas to China. It's also not about fish. Chinese fishermen do not fish commercially in the South China Sea. They only operate because they're subsidized. Trade is a problem. It is the busiest trading room on the planet, although the cost of diverting around Australia is not that big for most of the players. The people who would be hurt are countries like Vietnam and Thailand um, to a degree, Malaysia and Singapore, who literally have no path to the sea other than through the South China Sea. So then what happens? What's the global scenario, the global economic scenario? So it, it, I, I want to preface it, but it's very difficult for me to envision a world in which either the US or China intentionally block commercial traffic through the South China Sea. But this is not the biggest concern. I mean, the biggest concern would be that we would wake up in a world in which there is no such thing as international law anymore, that big powers take what they want and small powers suffer what they must. It would mean that the might is right. We would, we would be, you know, it would, it would suggest that the entire project of the last hundred years was a fantasy, a mirage, and that really we, we're going back to the rules of the jungle. If we add that up to what China is doing to Taiwan, um, you know, what's the combination of these two together? Well, there are clear parallels. Beijing still views itself as the weaker of the military parties. It would rather not have to test its military strength against the U.S. if it can afford it. And it knows that its greatest advantages are asymmetric. It has the world's largest coast guard. It has the world's largest uh, fishing flotilla. It has the world's largest militia. It's using militia forces in the South China Sea, um, you know, militia forces in the Taiwan Strait, illegal dredging around Kimin and Matsu, constant Coast Guard patrols around the Senkakus, all to put pressure on U.S. partners and allies in the hopes of wearing them down, of convincing them that resistance is futile, and all keeping this below the threshold at which the U.S. could justify military intervention. And that presents a real dilemma for the U.S. and its partners and allies. Because if China can win without fighting, then those partners now are going to look around and say, what's the point in being a U.S. ally if it doesn't defend my rights?
So what does the U.S. do? Well, what the U.S. is struggling to do, although I think it's it's beginning to find its footing, is to work more closely with a diverse network of allies and partners to combine capacity building for those states with diplomatic efforts, public transparency and naming and shaming campaigns, trying to impose non-military cost on Beijing while enhancing the resiliency of partners and allies and kind of really settling in for what's going to be a long challenge.